week. Let's open our Bibles uh, to um, the C- Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. We'll read that, and then we'll go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. So let's stand, give honor to God's word. Beautiful passage. I love this passage. It says, and you were, you were dead in the tr- trespasses and sins which you once walked, following the course of the world, of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived, once lived in passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but, but God being rich in mercy... Because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. In Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And now 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good word and work. Thanks. You may be seated. Got to get all the iPads set up here this morning for uh, multiple things. So hang on a second. Isn't that nice? Oh. All right. Here we go. How many of you like the campaign season? Isn't it wonderful? This is this is uh this is serious stuff, I think. As as I look at the the path that this thing is going, it's not a great path. Anybody you talk to say there aren't really good choices on either side of the aisle. And uh, um, there, there's, there's just so much negativity in this. So much discouragement. So much things that just kind of turn uh, people off. And uh, campaigning has just been somewhat horrific to, to watch it. I, I spent probably 10 minutes watching one debate and that was enough to make me sick. Just, just all the things being slammed. I was waiting for one person to say one good thing about maybe what they were hoping they could help this nation, how they could help this nation improve and better. It, it, it never, I never heard much of that. And as I thought about it, and you watch this campaign unfold and I've come to the conclusion it takes a lot of either nuts or courage and interpersonal strength to run for president. I'm not sure what it is, watching the way this thing has unfolded. Candidates are constantly attacking and being attacked, right? Um, Everything you've ever done in your life, right? Somebody's going to bring it up, and it's going to be fair game to be questioned, to be criticized, used against you by an opponent, to create even now uprisings and and riots and all kinds of things. I don't know if you know it, but this nation is not very stable at this time in its history. There's there's a lot of instability. There's economic instability. I'm sure every farmer kind of wonders what's going to be like. Number one, with moisture. Number two, with prices, what they get for things. There's just a lot of instability out there today. People are concerned. And when there's instability and you see the people who will potentially be your next leaders just squabbling, 
talking about all kinds of things and all kinds of things they're going to do and all kinds of money that they're going to spend and all the free trips and free rides they're going to give to people. And they're going to like, how are you going to pay for all this? I've never seen one Congress ever worry about how they're going to pay for anything. Now, we can't live that way, but that's the way our government is. And it's, it's a little bit, it, it creates a little bit of concern for all of us. And that's why we really need to pray for this election period. And um, uh, an event's coming up May 24th in Pier. Franklin Graham's going to show up in Pier, and he's going to every state in the nation calling people to pray. Pray for this election. Pray for our nation. Um, and Colin Reisner and Amanda are getting some people together to go to Pier on the 24th uh, to be a part of that rally. And we'll give you more information about that. But even if you're not able to go, there'll be several opportunities probably in the month of May with the National Day of Prayer and this, this uh, gathering that Frank and Graham's getting together at our state capitol to be praying for our nation because it needs lots of prayer. I mean, a candidate that enters this process of becoming uh, uh, involved for the run for the presidency uh, knows this process is very ruthless and unrelenting. Re relenting. They know that uh, you have to be very strong, you have to be secure, you have to be willing to take criticism, you have to hear all kinds of things said about you in the media, and you have to have really thick, tough skin to hear some of the things that are being said. You have to take a lot of personal shots against your character, against your person to be involved in this. As I think about this, the same is very much true when, it becomes, when you become a committed follower of Jesus Christ. When you step out in faith to believe in Jesus Christ, there is going to be some challenges. Our resolve to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ in this world will meet with some opposition, some adversity at times. And our desire to follow Jesus will require courage, inner strength, and confidence, right? And we know this because Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you're going to have trouble. And we know that the trouble comes from three primary sources, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We learn about that in 1 John chapter 3. These target the foundation of our faith, seeking to wear it away, seeking you to, to get you to question what you believe, question whether you can trust God, right? To even question if God's even there as you go through the hardships and trials of life. Now, we know the disciples of Jesus Christ in the city of Thessalonica found out firsthand once they received the good news of salvation, once they committed to following Jesus Christ, being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, it all opened their lives to a new kind of trouble in this world. In the instant, they went from being ordinary citizens of their town, hanging out with their friends, doing all the things that people did in Thessalonica to pass the time in life, to being the target, the focus of people who are now embraced Jesus Christ. They became the focus and target of adversity, opposition, persecution, People that they once knew that were their friends were now hostile to them. People that they used to do business with uh, now uh, sort of shun them and sort of cut them out of their circle of friendship in life just by identifying with Jesus Christ. That he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And if this persecution that they faced wasn't that, that was so immediate wasn't enough. They also had to deal with false teaching that came in, seeking to strip away whatever confidence and hope they might have possessed through their personal faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul was concerned about the Thessalonians. He went from ex the experience of seeing the great joy of seeing these people come to faith in Jesus Christ and having the op opportunity to provide them helpful insight and wisdom to grow in their life with Jesus Christ, to be abruptly torn away from them because of the intense spiritual opposition and persecution. Paul wanted desperately to return to Thessalonica so he could help these believers continue to grow in their faith so that he could answer their questions, 
so that he could provide them counsel, direction, wisdom, to, so that their foundation would get sturdier and solid, so that they would have some ground to kind of stand on, firm against the false teaching and all the things that they were sort of being challenged with and, and had to deal with because they belonged to Jesus Christ. And so his purpose in writing these letters, both First and Second Thessalonians, was to strengthen the foundation of their faith so that they could endure this opposition that they were facing. Endurance is such an important quality in the Christian life. Uh, we were uh, studying the parable of, of, of the widow and the unrighteous judge on Wednesday night. And, and most people maybe not know about that parable. Uh, this lady went for this unjust judge, and, and he wouldn't give her justice. And she's a widow, and she was abused, and she was, she was defrauded of something. This lady kept going back and 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 back. Yeah, she just pestered this judge and pestered him and pestered him and pestered him and pestered him and pestered him. Finally, this this unrighteous judge just got tired of this woman coming, and he gave her justice. Not because he wanted to, not because he was a just man, not because he even thought she deserved it. She, he was just tired of her coming. And the whole point of the parable, Jesus says, we ought we ought. To continue to pray and not lose heart. And it's all in the context of things getting difficult in society. Because if you read the passage of Scripture before it in Luke chapter 17, Luke is telling us about things that are getting difficult in society as we get close to the recoming of the Son of Man. Jesus was telling them about those things, His disciples. As it gets closer to the time when the Son of Man returns, there's going to be difficulty and hardship. And that is the time when believers, disciples, followers of Jesus Christ need to pray for each other that we will persevere in our faith. That we'll be strong. That we won't give in to false teaching. That we won't become apathetic, indifferent, sort of laissez-faire about what we believe. That we'll be strong in it. We'll be committed to it. We'll be bold in it. We'll be willing to take the insults and the onslaught of whatever difficulties come our way. We'll be prepared for that. We'll be ready for that. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're ready for because our faith is grounded. It's confident. It's secure. Right? That's what we're to pray for. Parents, that's what you need to pray for your kids. Pray that the faith that is growing in their life will, be grow, will grow solid and secure in Jesus Christ because it's going to be tested. There's all kinds of things that are going to test the foundation of what you believe in this world. We need to pray for each other as we walk out of here today. Maybe see someone sitting next to you and make it your commitment to pray for them that in this week when their faith is tested, they will be found strong. They won't waver. They'll draw from the resources that they have in Jesus Christ to face this. So Paul's goal in writing the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians was to help these recent converts to the faith to regain their spiritual composure. Because it was upset, it was challenged by false teaching. And I said Paul was acting like a coach, a coach that's seen his team uh, experience a, a swing of events in the game where uh, the opponent runs off about five or six or ten unanswered points and his team is struggling. Everything they do, it seems to be uh, uh, going in the wrong direction. And what happens? The coach says, time out. Time out. And just like a, a coach, Paul's a spiritual coach, and just like coaches in timeouts, what do they do? What does a coach do in a timeout? First of all, he educates them. He tries to instruct them in the short minute or minute and a half that he has. He educates them with instructions to help them battle the opposition, to counter what the opposition is doing. And then he will encourage them, encourage them, reminding them of the skills they have. 
and that they built through their many hours of practice, put those into use. And then um, we all know that some of you have had coaches that exhort you, sometimes very loudly, sometimes with shouts. They exhort you to be strong, to get tough, to hang in there, right? And so in this spiritual time out, Paul's doing the same. He educated believers about the day of the Lord. He reminded them and provided them greater clarity of the events associated with this time period to assure them that it hadn't come yet, it hadn't, you're not in it yet, and that they could live confidently looking forward to Christ's return and, and the ultimate victory that they will share when Jesus returns. Then he encouraged them by reminding them that they're loved by God. And you're chosen by God as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You have security because God loves you. God brought about this salvation in your life. He orchestrated it. It was in his plan for your life before you ever existed. And he brought it to light in time through the preaching of the gospel. Then he exhorted them last week to stand firm, hold tight to the instructions that they had received. Don't give ground to false teaching. Hold tight to the truth that you have received. And then finally, today we see he concludes with a prayer. It's a prayer that ties all of this together. And I want to look at this prayer this morning. It's a prayer that Paul prays for these believers. And it commutes some very important spiritual truths for our encouragement as believers. Number one, the disciples of Jesus Christ. If you're a disciple, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You have a personal relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice Paul says, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. Notice Paul uses the word our twice. I think this is important. He's our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God our Father. In salvation, we have entered into a personal relationship with a heavenly father who claims us out of the world to be a part of his eternal family. We learn about that in scripture. It's called spiritual adoption in Christ. We're adopted into God's family where we can cry out to God as our Abba father. There's a personal relationship that God establishes with us as our Abba father. But we also develop a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, because he is the Lord Jesus Christ, he is our master. He is our shepherd. He's the one that's overseeing and is present to be the watchkeeper over our souls. And this shepherd, this master, is not an evil taskmaster. He is a shepherd who willingly bore the wrath of, of the Father in our place so that we could be saved from our sins. The Bible says, while we were strained like sheep, in response to that, God's gracious call of salvation came, and we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. It's through the relationship that we all enjoy and maintain with our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father that we receive the power, the resources, and the ability to stand firm and hold tight. Because most of us say, you know, the battles that come in our life, they just seem overwhelming. Where am I going to do this? I don't think I have the resources. I know I can't, can't deal with these things that come in my life. <clears throat> and a lot of times that conclusion comes after a lot of time of trying to figure this out on our own. And we get frustrated and we fail. and We kind of throw our hands in the air and say, it seems like this Christian life really isn't working all that well, right? We can get to that point of discouragement and defeat. When we fail to realize Jesus said to us, you must abide in me, right? You have to remain in me. You have to hang out with me. You have to draw your life from me. He said, without me, you can do nothing. And I remember preaching that sermon, without me, you can do nothing. That is something that flies in our face because we in our pride says we can do everything. The world tells us that. You put in your mind to anything and you can do it. And Jesus says, no, that isn't true. Anything significant spiritually, you cannot do without his help, without his spirit 
working in our life to produce the fruit that comes out of trial and adversity and testing when the grounding of your faith is under fire. You need a Savior to walk with. That's why I love that Doug chose that song, God With Us. That, I don't, that wasn't by accident. That was by purpose. Emmanuel, God with us. That's why Jesus was given that name, Emmanuel, God with us. God would have a very powerful presence with us to lead us, to guide us, to help us, to give us wisdom, counsel, direction for everything we need in life. And so in this prayer, Paul begins to tell us the resource, the great provider, right? For, for the strength that we need when we're tested. It's right there. It's in an abiding race, relationship with our Abba Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And it takes time. It takes, it takes some, some focus. It takes some regular activity in our life as we pray, as we read the Bible, as we connect with God, as He speaks to us through His Word, which takes time, which takes some, some focus, takes some scheduling into our life. And it's really cool that we have our Bibles on our phones because we can be sitting somewhere for five minutes and have free time and look at how our Heavenly Father wants to speak to us, wants to direct us, wants to guide us, wants to let us know, hey, don't worry about this. I'm with you always. I'll be your security and strength. And the challenge that we all face is, are we going to, will we abide, will we, will we remain in Christ, will we, will we cling to our Abba Father, because He is our provision, He is our resource, He is our provider, He gives us what we need. Now, now notice, the disciples of Jesus Christ, Paul says, receive from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, some wonderful provisions for their spiritual stability. God had your spiritual stability in mind, and he provided things for you and me so that we could remain confident, unshaken, unfathomed when the tide sees to be rising against us in life. And there are three resources in the passage. What are the provisions? First of all, when we are called to face adversity, and persecution and losses in life, when we are called to face unforeseen trials, uh, things that uh, kind of blindside us in life, interpersonal struggles, even when we have to say goodbye to people, which can be very difficult, the first resource God provided, provides to us is love. Paul says God's love for us is a stabling influence in our life. My knowledge of his unconditional acceptance of me will supply me with the spiritual strength I need to rightly respond to life's challenges. Nothing can separate me from his love. Here comes the challenge. Here comes the adversity. Here comes the opposition. Here comes the hardship. Here comes that blindsided thing that I wasn't expecting. Ah, how do I respond? I know that God loves me. Nothing can separate me from his love. Drawing from his deep love demonstrated for me through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. His love shown for me in his forgiveness of my sins. All of my sins helps me to maintain my spiritual composure in the face of spiritual testing. His love is there to take me. Uh, his love is there to take the worry and fear out of my life. God's love is there to take the worry and fear out of my life. Because of how significant, how comprehensive this love is, it stands to motivate me to words and works that bring glory and honor to his name. I want you to look at Ephesians. It's on the board. You don't even have to look at Ephesians 3. I like this passage because Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth has its name. According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. What is Paul praying? Paul is saying the strength of the Christians is not so much external in our might. It's not so much in our intellect, what we know. Our strength in the face of opposition, which Christians throughout history have always been able to produce 
when the, when the going was tough, when, when they were called to suffer, that came from an inner personal strength that they got from God's Spirit to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Every believer has intangible strengths to draw from that people without Jesus Christ just don't have. Because the resources you have to draw from are eternal and they come from a heavenly father. They come from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think probably one of the greatest challenges for every believer in our day is really understanding how equipped you are in Christ to face anything in this life. Jesus doesn't leave his disciples unequipped, ill-equipped to face what we're called to face in this world. He would be a horrible master. He would be an awful shepherd if he just threw us out to the wolves like the Thessalonians were to be persecuted without supplying them resources and provisions from his grace to them to thrive, to have the confidence and the strength to stand in there. And all throughout Scripture, we are reminded Of all the resources, all the abilities. I've used this illustration a million times, I think. Not quite. That's a lot. But, you know, I have one of these smartphones. I'm just a dumb user, right? Because all I really use on this phone um, is I call people. That's it. Once in a while, I text. But it's usually because someone texted me and I think it would be rude not to respond. People have all these group texts, and they want me to be a part of them, and I, I don't even know how to be a part of them. If you, if you call me, I usually respond to your call because I like to talk to people. I don't like to text necessarily. I do it. I think it's peer pressure. I guess I just gave in. I like to talk to people. I like to talk to you. It's better it's better if it's face-to-face, Right? But this phone has so much more than that, right? It's got everything. I mean, you can look up scores. You can, you can, you can Skype. You can, it's got a camera. It's a big picture. I mean, it, it's got so many things. I, I don't even have an ounce of idea what all this phone could do, and I've never used an ounce of it. Really, just a fraction of the, what this phone, you know, and it's kind of like the Christian life. We have tons of resources, right? God gives us so much in Jesus Christ, to be blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Think about that. But so often we settle for basic dialing. We only know some of the resources. We know a lot of things about a lot of things in life, but we fail to realize, we fail to apply, to understand. And why do we struggle in life? Why do we worry a lot? Why do we fret? Why do we anxiety? Why do we not know how to respond to the challenges that come to our life? It's because we're stuck on basic dialing when Jesus has supplied us with a rich resource of personal inner strength and wisdom and hope and help and confidence because of his love for us in Christ to overcome this, right? Not only does he give us love, but notice, eternal comfort. Now, this is a resource available to us for the purpose of our spiritual stability because, as the passage tells us, it's been given to us. God has given us eternal comfort, okay? So you say, what is eternal comfort? Here's what it is. And, and how does eternal comfort bring stability to my spiritual life and to my life in general? I think, I believe, here's a definition. Eternal comfort is the everlasting support of God's peace we derive from knowing that God is with us. It's the support of peace, of knowing 
that I, when I'm in this and I'm going through this, I'm not going through it alone. God is with me. It may not seem like it, but he says he is, and I'm going to trust that. It's having my mind set at ease, right, as I recall the eternal promises of God. Because eternal comfort or consolation is having a troubled mind, a challenged mind, a mind that's been, been put under pressure, been put under opposition, been put under adversity. It's a mind that is put at ease. It's put at ease. Why? Because I recall God's eternal promises to me. What has God promised me? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. He's promised me eternal life through Jesus Christ. He's promised me the Holy Spirit is with me. He's promised that he hasn't left me as an orphan here on this, that, that he's given of his spirit to help me. I, I think about this. Remember the 23rd Psalm. David prayed. What did he pray? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Remember he's prayed that? Even though I'm in the shadow of the valley of death, even though it's a very fearful thing to walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because why? You are with me. I don't walk through the valley of the shadow of death alone. I don't walk through the valley of opposition alone. I don't walk through the valley of adversity alone. For you are with me. Eternal comfort is the peace of his abiding presence. So many scriptures that talk about that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of all mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions. Did you see that? It says all our afflictions. That's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God comforts us not in some of our afflictions. He comforts us in every one of them. 